Hi everyone and welcome to a, another installment of the UCL Dark Invited Speaker Series. Today we're uh, thrilled to be hearing from Katya Hoffman uh, uh, on the topic of towards human-like and collaborative AI in video games. Katya is a, a principal researcher and lead of the Game Intelligence uh, Group at Microsoft Research Cambridge. Um, her research focuses on reinforcement learning driven by current and future applications of video games with a long-term goal of developing AI systems that learn to collaborate with people and empower their users to help solve real, complex, real-world problems. Her team is behind Project Malmo, a sophisticated experimentation platform for AI built on top of Minecraft. Uh, she completed her PhD in computer science as part of the Information and Language Processing Systems Group at the University of Amsterdam, supervised by Martin de Riga and Shima Whiteson. Um, yeah, really excited to hear the talk, Katya, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you for that uh, fantastic introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here virtually at UCL Dark. It's the first time I'm visiting, and um, who knows, maybe there will be a real visit at some point in the future. Um, in my talk today, I want to give you an overview of some of the research my team and I have been doing um, to push towards human-like and collaborative AI in video games. Um, as mentioned, all of this work is in collaboration with my fantastic team, as well as external collaborators. And so just to um, give you a short introduction, um, my team is shown here in the slide. Particular pleasure to highlight the uh, current research interns that are working with us on the next generation of research projects in this space, um, as well as our key research collaborators, um, Ida, Ali, and uh, Gavin, who have been instrumental in the work that I'm presenting today. Um, with um, my fantastic team, um, I focus on deep reinforcement learning in games. So we understand our mission as um, uh, being to advance uh, the state of the art in reinforcement learning, specifically to enable new applications in gaming. And just very briefly, um, we're thinking about two types of um, users for new applications in gaming. First, uh, for players, we're trying to understand what novel game experiences could be enabled by reinforcement learning. And so they're having more human-like um, um, co-players or opponents, um, artificial co-players or opponents within a video game is one type of experience that we're thinking about. And secondly, we're thinking about um, developers. So what kinds of insights or new tools and capabilities are needed in order to make reinforcement learning based approaches um, more widely available so that every game developer on the planet can leverage those to realize their creative visions. With that uh, setup, I'm going to go into some of our recent research. Um, and I just wanted to mention in case you have any shorter or clarifying questions throughout the talk, I'm happy to take questions at any time. Please feel free to just uh, jump in. Or if you would like to have longer discussions, we can leave that until the end of the talk. The first piece of work that I want to highlight is our work on the navigation Turing test. So our goal here was to uh, figure out how we can evaluate um, human-like behavior in games. And as I mentioned previously, one of our goals or one of the kinds of game experiences that we want to enable is um, the player to be able to play with or against um, characters that behave in a more human-like way than what was um, possible using traditional AI techniques, for example. Um, the key challenge we ran into right at the start of um, this, this um, project is that it's really, really hard to actually reliably measure human likeness. And so the um, kind of main way of assessing this that we identified in the literature is um, a, a type of cheering test. And so here we pushed forward and tried to understand what a human um, likeness um, test in terms of a a Turing test for human-like navigation in video games would look like and how reliably it could be assessed. We were also really interested in trying to understand whether this could be automated. So are current state-of-the-art machine learning models able to mimic um, the human assessments um, of human likeness? And finally, we um, applied this um, benchmark to try and understand whether current um, state-of-the-art reinforcement learning agents are actually capable of producing um, behavior that um, would be identified as human-like. And so those are the three, um, the, the answers to those three questions are what I want to discuss today. 
Before I go into those, um, to uh, ground the work and the actual navigation task that we um, uh, presented here, um, we set up this navigation task in the video game Bleeding Edge. So I want to emphasize that this navigation in itself is not uh, nowhere near as complex as uh, playing the full game of Bleeding Edge. Um, Bleeding Edge is a video game that is developed um, by a game studio called Ninja Theory, which is conveniently based here in, in Cambridge, just around the corner. Um, this video game is very complex and it's set up to really challenge um, human ability to collaborate and compete with each other. It's a four by four um, game where um, teams of, of four players each battle, for example, for control of um, specific platforms or collect resources and deliver them to those platforms. Now, in order to start and make progress towards um, human-like play um, approaching that complexity, we teased out um, goal-based navigation as a very first step to try and identify whether this is something that we could already achieve using the current state of the art to make progress on measuring and evaluating performance. But we really see this as a stepping stone towards that longer term goal of enabling learning of complex human-like behaviors in video games more generally. Um, so that's the context here. Um, um, as mentioned, so we set this up as it's a um, convenient subtask of what a player would need to do within the game. So within the game, they would, for example, need to navigate to a um, seed cluster that they need to collect. Um, and on the left here, you see what the player would um, typically view. So it's a third person game over the shoulder perspective. Um, the player would see um, this, this view and be able to identify the geometry of the space, et cetera. Um, they would also see a minimap um, similar to what I'm showing here on the right. And so on this minimap, the player would at all times see the location of their own avatar um, as well as um, strategic places within the game. So for example, they would be able to see the position of um, um, seed clusters that have been found by their teammates, um, the platforms that are open, um, as well as teammates locations or opponent locations for, for those opponents that are visible to any of the teammates. Um, so in terms of what you see here on the screen, this is roughly the information that a human player um, would have. Um, shown in um, green on the minimap are the goal locations that we used in our work. So the, the goal of both the human and the artificial agent was to um, navigate in a human-like way to a goal location that was indicated um, for, for human players in terms of a cross on that minimap um, for the agent in, in terms of coordinates. Um, so to um, solve this task or, or set up a, a set of agents that um, was uh, relatively representative of the current state of the art in reinforcement learning. We um, trained two agents that were based on a paper that had been recently um, put on archive by Alonso et al, Deep Reinforcement Learning for Navigation in AAA Video Games. And so there we um, kind of um, assumed that these were fairly representative of what um, reinforcement learning was, was able to do um, today. They had very impressive results for navigation in video games. So this seemed to be a very appropriate choice of agents. We had a, a smaller hypothesis here, which was that um, we thought with a more human-like observation space, um, we would be able to get agents that behaved in a more human-like way. And so to test that out, we set up two variants of our agents, one called symbolic, where the um, information available to the agent consisted of the goal location, so relative angle and distance to the agent, um, a visual frame average depth so that the agent could gauge, for example, whether it was um, facing an obstacle or wall, as well as the agent's absolute position. Um, this was um, um, processed um, using a series of, of fully connected layers which was then used to um, estimate a value estimate and, and action logics. And we used a PPO um, algorithm here to, to actually train those. Um, for the hybrid agent, in addition to those symbolic observations, we also provided the agent with a, um, with a crop of the depth channel, a 32 by 32 center crop. And so we hypothesized that this was closer to the kind of information that a human would use 
um, uh, again, to, to test this hypothesis of whether that would give us more human-like behavior. Um, this was, of course, processed using um, convolutional filter and then eventually concatenated with the information coming from the uh, symbolic stream. Um, the action space here was discrete, um, a very small discrete action space of consisting of no movement moving forward and then various degrees of moving left and right. Um, and we provided a dense reward signal because the key challenge here was not so much um, understanding whether we could learn in a particular challenging setting, but to understand whether the behavior that resulted was human-like or not. Um, so we provided a positive reward when moving towards the goal, large positive reward um, for reaching the goal, and a negative per step penalty. So those were the agents that we trained on the navigation task that um, I just showed you. And then the key um, kind of um, uh, that, that we wanted to try and understand here was, first of all, whether the human navigation Turing test that we had set up um, was a suitable tool for allowing um, human assessors to distinguish between human and um, agent behavior. Um, and so I've, I show you one example task on this slide here. Um, and as you can see, the assessors were asked to identify which video was more likely to be produced by a human. We can repeat this experiment here. I believe if I uh, hit play, this should be playing. Yes. Um, I'm not sure the video is playing well enough, but if you can see this all right, um, I would like to ask you in the audience to uh, guess um, which of the videos is more likely to be human versus agent. I mean, can I can I ask the action spaces sure. of the human players and the agent are they the same or they're they're not the same and this did this was one factor in actually being able to identify which one was human so the humans were playing with um, either controller or um, mouse and keyboard whereas the action space for the agent was much more restricted right okay yeah I think then then it, if you know that then I think it's relatively clear I would say. <laughs> Sounds good. So do you have a guess? Yeah, I would say video eye is then a human, right? Because that looked much less, that looked more continuous, the kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other guesses or, or um, pieces of uh, clues on the call? I don't see any media, please. So yes, uh, video A was indeed human and um, the factor that you mentioned um, did play a role. Um, other clues that um, human assessors identified was that um, the uh, agent um, tended to be closer to walls or seemingly running into walls. Um, also interestingly, the agent sometimes um, moved more optimally towards the goal and humans don't necessarily take the very shortest path. Um, so there were a couple of interesting insights from the more detailed justification that also gave us clues on what is identified as um, human-like behavior or agent-like behavior. Um, the action space you mentioned was, was a common giveaway, and that is also something that we improved in the future. Um, but for the moment here, our main focus was on trying to understand, um, one, the quality of the assessment, and then two, um, what establish essentially a baseline to then um, be able to move beyond this. So let's take a look at the uh, results. Um, first on the left, I'm showing the typical um, um, performance plot over the number of training steps for the agents. I'm showing this here in terms of time to go in seconds because this is um, a way in which we can most um, accurately compare the agent performance to a human performance, at least um, approximately. Um, if we were to look at reward, for example, that would be a little bit more challenging. And reward, of course, can be, can be changed almost arbitrarily. So we wanted to make sure we have something reasonably comparable here. Um, you can see that um, both types of agents, both hybrid and symbolic agent, converge. Um, the symbolic one um, had a little bit lower variance in terms of converging to a near optimal policy, but both are within the, the um, uh, confidence um, interval of the human agents. So they roughly perform as well as human players um, after a reasonable um, amount of training time. So then the real question was really, 
um, whether the uh, human assessors would um, find a difference between the um, trained agents and the actual humans. And so as we can see in the plot on the right, um, the human assessors actually did find a large difference between human and um, agent behavior. Um, to give you a point of reference, the line in green is showing um, the, the place where 50% of um, um, where a given assessor would judge um, the agent to be human-like or the human to be human-like um, as equally likely. Um, so if um, an agent were to pass the Turing test, we would want to see a concentration um, towards that 50% um, chance line. And we can see that um, the vast majority of our assessors are actually above this line. So the assessors were able to identify the um, agent uh, very reliably. We were only, or our trained agents were only able to fool the assessors um, in a very small number of cases, as you see in those few um, dots um, towards, the, towards, the, towards the middle of the plot. Um, we, um, therefore can conclude that at least with our current setup, um, the agents trained were learning very effective um, navigation behaviors, um, but the learned, um, let's say near optimal behavior is no guarantee for um, actually producing human-like behavior. So this highlights the importance of, if you want a human-like behavior, you need a different measurement tool in order to assess um, whether the behavior is actually human-like. And so to the best of our current understanding, these uh, types of navigation, uh, this type of navigation Turing test would be the gold standard for assessing whether behavior is actually judged human-like or not. Um, I mentioned our smaller hypothesis between the hybrid and symbolic agent. And so here is a chart that shows the proportion um, of, of times where an assessor preferred the um, um, hybrid versus symbolic agent or uh, judging them as more human-like. And so from this, you see that um, there was a small number of comparisons where we showed um, a video from the hybrid and the symbolic um, agent side by side, instead of showing um, a, a human video. And in the vast majority of um, assessors um, did judge the hybrid agent as more human-like. So we do see some evidence that aligning the observation space with what a human would perceive in this um, setup um, is able to produce more human-like behavior. Next, um, I mentioned that we were also interested in understanding whether um, the human assessments could be um, uh, matched by um, automated um, by automated classifiers, for example. Um, you can imagine this as very similar to um, the types of discriminators that are, for example, used in, in imitation learning today. Um, and so here we focused on um, constructing different um, inputs or different observation spaces and trying to understand to what degree the um, classifiers with those different observation spaces were able to replicate um, the human judgments that we, that we observed. Um, there were four main areas um, shown here on the slide. The first was purely a symbolic classifier. So we um, provided observations that uh, purely consisted of the XYZ positions. And in one variant, we um, were processing this using a feed forward in one, a recurrent um, network with a Jirio. Um, secondly, we provided the visual input. Um, and again, processing that using feed forward, or um, I think here that should be a convolutional network um, versus GRU. And we constructed two, two additional um, observation spaces that we um, thought could be interesting to, to uh, um, use here. One um, bar chart CNN summarizes each video um, by um, averaging the uh, um, color values for each image. So you get one line per image, and then we stack this um, on the time dimension. So things that you can see here, for example, are um, these um, curves, and you can see how jagged or how continuous um, those, those were. Um, looking at this visually, um, we were able to identify agent from human behavior quite accurately. 
Um, but as you see in the result um, for the automated classifiers, that wasn't actually the case. Um, and finally, we had the um, TD, I forgot what it stands for right now, um, CNN, but this is essentially a projection of the path in 2G space so that you can see in a top-down view um, what path the agent would take. Now, looking at the results um, for this, I want to start with um, the plots on the, on the left of this graph, identity accuracy. So this is the accuracy that we obtain when asking the classifier whether um, the observed video was actually agent or actually human. This is what we mean by identity accuracy here. And so a few high level results is that um, we can see that both the symbolic um, feed forward and symbolic recurrent model achieve very high accuracy. I believe this was um, approximately um, 86%. And this was quite impressive to us because this is proper, um, this, this is on a proper held out test set. So using both um, agent um, checkpoints and um, human players that hadn't been seen during um, training time. Um, so we are quite confident that there is a true signal here. Um, we also see that, um, interestingly, the visual classifiers do not perform very well. So there there's, remains an open question on why specifically the symbolic um, classifiers are able to um, do this um, identification so accurately. Um, the second line um, is very, very similar to the first, um, but instead of doing binary uh, classification on um, individual um, examples, we here set this up as a comparison. So you get um, the classifier gets two examples and has to detect which one is more likely to be human, mimicking the setup that we had for the human judges. We see that the results are almost identical. So the signal here is, is very, very similar to the, to the first case. Finally, one that we were particularly interested in is the hybrid symbolic comparison. So with this, we were trying to see whether um, current classifiers would be able to give us those finer nuances. So when human assessors say that a hybrid agent is more human-like than a symbolic one, this is ideally what we would like to capture um, with a classifier because that would allow us to use it as a proxy to understand whether we're making progress towards training human-like agent behaviors. Unfortunately, with the classifiers we evaluated, that is not possible. You can see here that um, these actually perform at or below chance level across all the different um, um, uh, representations that we tried. And so a key limitation that we, that we identified here is that um, currently capturing those finer nuances of what it means to be more human-like while you still have um, agent behavior is something that is currently completely unsolved. And so this is something that um, we're following up on and would love to um, get insights if people have ideas on, on, on how this could be improved. So the key takeaway here are that um, symbolic models have high accuracy on the test set um, and um, unfortunately, all models perform poorly when asked to differentiate between two agents. So we can conclude that, agent, that, that automated classifiers are able to distinguish between human and agent behaviors, but very likely they are not capturing the correct features. So they're not able to capture correctly what it is that makes an agent human-like or non-human-like. Katya, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Laura Toni. Uh, sorry, I will not show my face because I'm a little bit unwell, so I will just use the Thank voice. You. So I'm so sorry about that. Um, thanks for the uh, for the presentation, which is really interesting. But I have a question that is general about uh, human being, right? So can you comment a little bit more on, on the key motivation? Because of course, before RL was always about achieving performance, not. Uh, acting like human. So I found very interesting that the test, the, the, the Turing test, but uh, do you think this is mainly for games because maybe you don't want the other players to understand that on the other side there is a machine or it's something that it should be important for RL in general and at large? Mm -hmm. So it would be good if you could comment a little bit more on that. Absolutely. Fantastic Thanks. question, Laura. Thanks so much for, for asking this. Um, so the way the research evolved was that this was a problem com uh, commonly mentioned by our collaborators on the gaming side. So we, you know, we, we collaborate with internal game studios, we um, work with them to train agents, and then 
very often the performance of the well, the, the performance of the agent is optimal in some sense, um, given some reward signal. But um, very often the complaint is that um, the behaviors aren't as readable or as intuitive or as comprehensible as um, of a human player. And so we um, kind of extracted from this that essentially what a lot of game experiences require um, are behaviors that um, are more like what a human might do in those situations. That might not be reflective of the general human player population. Um, some human players behave in ways that you probably don't want to replicate in a game. Um, but that could be, for example, an idealized um, um, human player. Uh, for example, an expert player specifically providing um, demonstrations for that particular game, or that could even be um, a game designer um, modeling how they would like the, the character to behave. Um, the key challenge is that capturing this in a reward signal is typically um, hard. And so we are looking for more general ways that uh, would allow um, would allow us to learn those human-like behaviors. Um, at the same time, even though the motivation for us started from the gaming side, I believe that um, producing human-like behavior is very important for a variety of, of application areas. And so broadly beyond gaming, I'm interested in understanding how um, agents could become um, human compatible. And I believe that um, being able to perform in a human-like way is key to human compatibility in many settings. For example, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an autonomous driving situation, um, an agent's behavior in a mixed human AI setting would still have to be interpretable to um, human drivers. And so there, yeah. I believe that understanding how to achieve that is really important. Yeah, I see. That's actually very, very interesting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the fantastic question. Pausing just to see if there are any other immediate thoughts. If not, let me just briefly summarize um, this section of the talk. So in this part, we uh, um, spoke about deep reinforcement learning agents and um, established that they, um, as, as you probably expected, can learn to efficiently navigate in 3D environments. At the same time, even when an agent is able to learn efficient navigation, that is no guarantee that the resulting behavior will be identified as human-like. And we were able to show that in, in our example, um, even though the agents converge to um, optimal or near optimal behavior in terms of um, speed to the goal, for example, humans could reliably tell the difference between human and agent um, gameplay. So we conclude that high skill alone is not enough for reproducing human likeness. We um, um, proposed and um, assessed a automated human and an automated navigation Turing test and found that it is able to discriminate humans from agents, um, but capturing those finer differences of um, when an agent would be um, judged more human-like than another remains an open challenge. With that, I want to move to the second piece of work that I, that I want to discuss today. Um, this is focusing on learning ad hoc collaboration with probabilistic predictive models. Um, and this work, um, like the previous one, is motivated by the challenges um, posed by human team play in complex modern video games. Um, at the same time, it's still much more academic in nature. So I'll be working with um, a toy game um, in order to illustrate the concepts here. Um, so the focus here is ad hoc teamwork um, and is illustrated in the simplified problem setting that I'm showing here on the left uh, of the slide. Um, in this um, coin game, um, we have two agents that um, need to collect um, coins and bring them to the bank. Now, if we take the perspective of just um, one of those agents, um, a key challenge to that agent in trying to um, collaborate with other agents in an ad hoc setting could be to understand the, the preferences and current state of mind of the other agent. So for example, if I can very quickly understand that um, the agent I'm playing with is mainly interested in collecting red coins and bringing those to the bank, then I can focus my efforts accordingly and I will avoid moving towards um, coins that um, I know the other agent will take. And so the key um, problem that we focused on here is how 
um, the agent that we're controlling could learn as quickly as possible about the preferences and current uh, mindset of the other agent in order to adapt its policy appropriately. The approach that we're proposing here um, is called MALIBA. Um, and I forget what the current version of the acronym stands for, <laughs> but I'm, um, I assure you that it makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the approach consists roughly of um, four components. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each of those. Um, on a high level, the idea is that our agent observes the other's behavior and models the other's um, place and mindset by trying to predict the other's future actions. Um, as mentioned, the um, current understanding of the other agent is summarized in terms of the other's play style and mindset. And um, with the summary, we can now condition our agent's um, own policy on the summary in order to um, learn a policy that accurately trades off um, between exploration and exploitation, given um, uncertainty over the other's play style and mindset. We're using a, a variational based approach in order to um, capture uncertainty here. So to dive into this in a little more detail, um, observing the other's behavior um, here uh, purely means that our agent observes um, the trajectory up to a given time step t. So here we make the simplifying assumption that we can observe the um, state and action of the other agents. So the only thing that is unknown to us is um, the, uh, the policy of the other agent. And we try to find a way to extract um, that policy as quickly as possible and base our decisions on our current understanding of the others um, on the other's behavior. Um, as mentioned, we do that by predicting future actions. And I won't have time to go into too much detail here, but um, want to highlight that um, there are a couple of components to this model. And the um, kind of uh, uh, approach is modeled on some of the ideas that you might have seen in the uh, machine theory of mind paper. So we assume two latent variables, um, the current um, state of mind and the, of the other agent, as well as its long-term character or preferences. Um, and those two latent variables um, are used to summarize or learn a, a latent summary that is able to um, be decoded accurately in order to predict the uh, future actions of the agents. Um, and as you can imagine, as we have trajectory information here, we can do this in hindsight. So after we have observed time step t plus one, we can um, make this prediction for the previous time step. We can construct a loss and we can um, update our, um, our, our, our elbow obje objective in this case um, appropriately. Now, from this process, we get um, the latent representation, which um, consists in the um, um, parameters of a distribution that um, characterizes the um, other's play style and mindset, as I mentioned. And now key to the approach here is that we use these um, summaries to um, condition our policy. So these end up forming an additional set of inputs in addition to the current state and our own agents um, actions are now um, predicted based on this uh, summary as well as the state. Um, the hypothesis is that um, this allows our agent to learn a policy that appropriately takes into account um, both our knowledge and our uncertainty about the other agent's behavior. Um, to see how this performs, we evaluated this on a couple of um, um, grid world based examples. I'm, I'm just showing one set of examples here in this coin game that we saw before. Um, the key um, that this uh, approach is able to do is that it can very quickly um, adapt to um, uh, other opponents. And we can see this by comparing to an approach RL2 that was a state-of-the-art meta-learning approach um, at the time we did the work, so almost a year ago. And we can see that um, the average return for our approach Maliba um, very quickly increases. And I believe the um, optimal return here is around 10, so it achieves near optimal performance very quickly. In this particular game, we don't see a major difference between Maliba M, which does the separation into play style and um, 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 current um, state of mind, um, but rather this performs um, relatively 
similar to the flat uh, version of the approach. We have other um, um, game examples where that separation is more clear, but it remains an open challenge to understand when a more complex hierarchical model makes sense and when it's um, not necessary to have that kind of information. Um, to um, understand- Katya, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Laura again. Sorry for the interruption, but uh, mm, um, I just have a question that is really related to this, this, this problem. So I'm just curious to, to hear more about that because we are working on, on, on on the RL problem that is alchemy, and you might be aware of where you, you still have a kind of condition at RL, but on, on more of the task, while it seems that in your case, you are conditioning on the adversarial mm -hmm. strategy. Is that correct? Um, yeah. that's, that's correct, yeah. So this particular work focused on um, ad hoc um, adaptation to, to other opponents. Um, this is based on previous work that um, um, Luisa also led, which uh, resulted in an approach called um, very bad, which is for variational <laughs> base adaptive um, decision making, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and so this is a um, base adaptive, or you could call it a meta learning approach that tries to identify the task as quickly as possible. So that could be something to take a look at because um, similar to the characteristics of the approach here, this is an approach that is able to um, it, it maintains a posterior over the mm -hmm. um, tasks. And so after each interaction with the environment, you update your posterior. And that means that even within the first episode of interacting with a new task, the agent can maintain an accurate um, posterior over, over the task and act accordingly. So that allows it to um, trade off exploration and exploitation in a, in a base optimal way, at least um, well, in more complex settings, we're, we're not able to work out the exact base optimist strategy, um, but in simpler settings, we're able to show that, that it very accurately um, tracks that solution. Okay, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so, okay, so, well, maybe if next week there will be some one-to-one uh, uh, -one meeting we can discuss more because we are also looking at some disentangled strategies and, and I would really like to, to hear more about that. So, um, thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to follow up and learn more about how you're thinking about the space. And also briefly mentioned that Louisa Zentgraf, who was uh, both the lead author here and, and on the paper I mentioned, she's done um, a lot of really interesting work in meta reinforcement learning mm. recently on um, exploration in, in complex mm -hmm. tasks. So uh, do take a look at, at her work. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, that's perfect. I will. And, and we're also looking at some casual RL aspects. So also you mentioned posterior, I mean, what mm. you mentioned maybe also be very useful. So um, that would be great. Okay, thank you. I will have a look at her work too. Fantastic, look forward to chatting. More. Thank you. Great, so I think I covered this, um, unless there are any more questions on this work in particular at this point, I move forward. Um, the remaining um, pieces of work are things that I just wanted to briefly highlight. Um, so in the beginning of this talk I mentioned we're uh, targeting both player experiences and um, um, opportunities for game developers. And here are just some short vignettes on some of the work that, we're, that we've done in this space. Um, first, I want to highlight work that was led by um, our postdoc Mikhail Jacob. Um, and the paper, it's unwieldy and takes a lot of time, challenges and opportunities for creating agents in commercial games, actually won the best paper award at um, last year's AID conference. Um, this was a piece of work that was fascinating to me because Mikhail really went back to the, to the, to the basics and tried to understand um, what might be blocking industry professionals from using reinforcement learning or related AI techniques as part of their game development process today. Um, the approach he took was that he did an in-depth survey with um, game industry professionals and was able to surface like, both challenges and opportunities in adopting recent technologies in game development. As mentioned, I won't be able to go into a lot of detail on this, so I just want to give you the one slight overview of the, the, the huge breadth of material that is in the paper. Um, we analyzed the uh, responses here um, in terms of opportunities and challenges 
on the design side, implementation and evaluation side. And just to give you one example, um, one challenge that um, game designers typically mentioned was that they um, experienced a lack of control. So trying to understand how they could get agents to behave in a particular way um, was something that they found quite challenging. So if you're interested in this space, I do encourage you to take a look at uh, the survey of, of key opportunities. Um, one follow-up work that came out of uh, Mikhail's um, paper here and that he did together with his intern Batu um, uh, last year was um, to try and get an understanding of what designer-centered um, reinforcement learning could look like. Um, here I'm pointing to a blog post that explores some of those ideas, um, but I also want to emphasize here that this challenge of how to um, give game developers or game designers control of the RI training process, how to make um, the resulting behaviors interpretable and controllable. I think there remain a lot of key open challenges. So if you're interested in this space, um, would love to have a chat and maybe um, um, point out some of the opportunities and directions in this space. Um, finally, Robert mentioned um, Project Malmo um, in the introduction to the talks. So I did want to briefly mention this. In case you haven't come across Project Malmo, um, it is an AI experimentation platform built on top of Minecraft. Um, it's open source on GitHub, and there are a lot of cap capabilities such as connecting agents into the game. You have control of the environment. There are multi-agent um, capabilities. Um, the key um, um, benefit or, or value that I see to Project Malmo is that it really allows us to think about what um, next generation challenging tasks could look like where either RL agents are trained to solve complex tasks in complex environments, um, or they learn to collaborate with human players in those complex environments. Um, because of, of this really interesting challenging space, I'm particularly happy that um, in the coming um, Europe's conference, there will be three competitions that um, are based um, on Minecraft and that really um, try to push the state of the art and what's possible in reinforcement learning um, and, and related AI techniques. Um, so I want to briefly highlight those here. There are fantastic teams organizing those. And so if you are looking for challenging research problems, then these are absolutely worth taking a look. Um, the first one is the uh, diamond competition. Um, this is one that is well established and um, a fantastic team that I've worked with in the past. Um, the goal here is to learn how to leverage human demonstration data for learning um, complex tasks more sample efficiently. The complex task, the, the, the flagship task here is to train an agent from scratch to uh, um, teach them to find um, a diamond within, within Minecraft. And if you do play Minecraft, you might know that this involves a large number of steps, um, starting from um, 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 cutting trees, making sticks, um, starting to make various um, tools, all the way up to pickaxes that are able to go through stone um, and actually finding a diamond. So very, very challenging task here. Um, the second competition is called the Basalt competition. Um, this is one that is newly established this year, um, and it focuses on learning complex tasks with human feedback. So these are tasks without a human reward function, and you can see a few examples of those on the right. So they go all the way to trying to understand how we can teach an agent to make a waterfall or find a cave without such a predefined reward function from um, any variety of human feedback um, that, that the uh, competitors in this case can come up with. And last but not least, there's the igloo competition, which um, focuses on leveraging natural human dialogue to learn in a collaborative uh, Minecraft environment. And so there, the idea is that um, through human dialogue um, interaction, an agent can learn how to, com uh, how to complete new complex tasks. Again, as I mentioned, hugely exciting research challenges, and I do encourage you to take a look and uh, hopefully participate in one of those competitions. Um, so in summary, in the talk today, um, we discussed um, recent research um, by my team and fantastic collaborators. First of all, the navigation Turing test, where we looked at learning to evaluate human-like navigation. Um, second, I give an overview of our work on ad hoc collaboration using the Maliva approach. Um, 
we took a brief look at some of the work that my team has done on the game um, developer site, um, especially looking at um, giving game designers more control over the reinforcement learning process. And finally, I highlighted Project MAMO and especially the three exciting competitions that um, will be pushing boundaries at NeurIPS 2021. With that, if you want to learn more about our recent research and opportunities in our group, um, our website is here, aka.ms slash game intelligence. And with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention and look forward to any remaining questions or discussion that you might have. Awesome. Thanks so much for the talk, Katia.